Hopefully the enthusiasm in my voice is going to carry this class through the afternoon. I remember when I was doing engineering, there was a prof of fluid, fluid mechanics. His tone was so steady that I could go there, and it was an afternoon class, and I was in, never made it one class without passing out asleep. <laughs> I remember I did a Tim Hortons challenge once. I had 12 sugars, and I told my classmates, I was like, I'm going to make it to the end of this class. And this guy was smart. I mean, there's no doubt the information was very useful and extremely valuable. I could not make in this guy. I'm like, you can see I'm Latin. I speak with intonation. The voice dynamics are different. This fellow had his voice was steady. It was perfect. I never made it to the end of one class ever, ever, ever. Now, my grade in fluids was not great either, <laughs> clearly. So I'm always trying to say, I'm going to try to keep everyone awake through the energy of my voice. All right. So what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about troubleshooting electrical things on your boat. As you can see, the challenge with troubleshooting electronics is it's pretty intense. Besides troubleshooting power, then you need to start being in the application layer, right? Like you need to go. So don't be too daunted and overwhelmed if the electronics seemed a little bit hard. It is. It's much easier to troubleshoot an electrical system than it is to troubleshoot an electronic system, okay? So in terms of pay grades, um, I just find it, it's a normal evolution and it's completely separate, but it gets pretty, it's like solving a computer problem, right? At the end of the day, it's non-trivial, like it's a skill. So you can do a certain amount of work on your own, but at that point, if you can't, you don't want to be too hard on yourself it's pretty geeky, right? Unless you live and breathe this stuff, you're not going to be able. And then we didn't even talk about bugs within the unit, right? Like I know and my technician is like, oh yeah, that bug happens when this happens, that happens of that generation for that code. I'm like, how the hell as an operator, you're going to know that? You're not. So you're not supposed to be completely self-reliant in troubleshooting your own electronics just by yourself. It's just not going to happen. It's not realistic. You do the best you can. And at one point you go, I done, I've done what I can. I need help. And that's normal. And we do the same. So conceptually, yesterday we talked about all of this. Um, and that's a typical, maybe not everyone has all of these things on their boat, but that's pretty much what a boat DC electrical system looks like. Now, of course, some of us have more batteries and you know, we have 24 volt systems and 12 volts, but at the end of the day, it still can be brought down to something like this. All right. So, chargers. Now, that's a good thing to troubleshoot, right? Common. We all have one. If you don't have one, you should have one. So, what are the common things for troubleshooting a charger? Well, the first thing is, what does a charger do? It takes power, AC power, and converts it to DC. The first thing you got to figure out is, does my charger actually have power? So a common thing you're going to want to make sure is that you're going to want to make sure that the breaker here, right, is actually on. And it's actually not probably labeled charger. It's probably labeled converter. So that's confusing. In the old days, they were computers. Converter. So I get people that have new handoffs with boats, not their own boat, an older boat. And they're like, I have never idea what the converter thing was, so I never turn it on. Unrelated, my engine batteries are dying, and I don't understand why they don't get a charge. I'm like, well, actually, it is sort of related. You decided and were never told to turn on the converter, which is your battery chargers for your engines. Oh, but my house gets a charge. Oh, yeah, but that's from your inverter charger. Oh, you mean I have two chargers? Yeah, you do. You have two chargers on your boat. So first thing is you got to have AC going to the charger, right? And AC, remember, your charger will not work if you're not connected to shore power or you're not having the generator run. So you even go at the beginning, you're like, hey, your charger will only work if either of those two sources are on, if your source selector is enabled, right? So if your panel, your, and this is why an AC voltmeter is really useful in the panel, if you don't have volts at the panel, don't start worrying about turning on switches, right? It's all about chasing power from the source. The generator is going to have a, literally a circuit breaker. It might have tripped. Press that. After that, make sure this... Source selector, and by the way, they get old and then they fail. 
That could be the issue. So when you're troubleshooting, you're like, do I have power in my AC panel? Is nothing working on my AC panel? Or just my charger not working on my AC panel? So process of elimination. If only your charger's not working, try to trip that breaker. That clamp on meter would tell you, you could literally go and actually, without ever even measuring voltage, you could actually put it on a single wire, not the cable, because the cable is actually gonna see the sum, and the sum is zero, because there's current going one way and current coming back. You wanna be able to ca catch the hot or the neutral, and you put it on around this, and you could actually see if this is getting power. The other way would actually see if also there's lights here, that would be another one. If this is actually energized, but you could have this receive power and this is dead, right? So you could use also use from Home Depot a little wand, right? They can actually measure the pulsation of current, right? They're about $10. And actually have it close to the AC input to the charger. If it lights up and this is not lit up, you know that there's AC coming in and this is not lit up, this is the problem. Stop, replace the charger. Right? It's pretty simple. Now, if you have AC coming in, you have lights on the device, and your batteries are not charging, then what the problem most likely is, is that the fuses might be blown, right? Or that your charger's badly installed, and it's on a switch. And I've seen that where charger outputs are switched. Never should be, black and white. And the switch near the battery is off and you have to have the battery switch on for the charger to be connected to the battery. Basically, that's how you troubleshoot a charger. It's not that hard, but you start from the source and you work your way down. It is definitely possible that your fuse will be blown. It's possible. A lot of people will put a 40 amp fuse on a 40 amp charger, thinking that a charger is a load. It is not a load. A charger is a charger. It doesn't pull current on the DC side. It pushes it. So if we install a 40 amp charger, we put a 50 amp fuse, and I have gauge eight wire, right, that can handle 50 amps. It will never get 50 amps, but for safety, I'll put gauge eight, 50, and I'll put a 50 amp fuse for never for having nuisance stripping. You have a question? Is that fuse, like how many volts do you go on where the fuse is Oh, none, like, I don't know, like 2%. Most fuses, there's none. Or they're gonna put the fuse completely in the wrong place. People think a fuse is this magical device that somehow protects all things. It's sort of the equivalent of a magic wand. You just move it around someplace and everything around in that direction is, they don't understand the location of the fuse is important. Like you lock the front door of the house, not the back door, and wonder why people are inside your house. Like, if they can come in, like, what's the point of having locking the exit? You want to stop something from coming into your house, not leaving your house. And, and what kind of fuse would you use? On this, you could do an MRBF. We talked about, um, there's another one that's maxi fuse is a good one. They call in smaller sizes. A maxi is a really good one. You could even put a thermal circuit breaker. I see thermals all the time. They come small, but they're pretty, they're more expensive but at least they're resettable. You see those little resettable thermal circuit breakers on those? Generally, they're gonna install them right beside the charger. Any other questions on chargers? Yes? Schematically, is that fuse meant to get started at the end of the line? Uh, the battery source is the real thing with energy. So the fuse is right at the start of power. The real power is from here. A battery charger will only ever output 40 amps or 50 amps or whatever it's rated at. It's not gonna fail high. The, the eternal power is really at the battery. This has endless power. Well, not endless, but for our sake, pretty much endless. So you put the fuse at the power supply. Now, if you wanna get really crazy, you should have a fuse on both sides of the circuit. Like, but I would be so happy if people started fusing at least the battery. Like, I mean, I'm no, I, have, I have hopes. Yeah, because the real, the real, remember this wire will never fail. It's rated for 50 amps, right? This will only ever get 40. Where is the short going to be? There's no problem. You're fusing this because if this ever shorts here, this source of power here is definitely more than 50 amps. Your battery will, is not limited to 50 amp output. 
could do 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Like on a dead circuit, there is no limit. Well, there is a limit, but it's going to be pretty high up there to unbelievable. So the battery is what you're worried about. Yes? So when you had that uh, schematic about the, uh, when you shorted, the yeah, the video. Yeah. If you had a, would that, would this fuse blow in that case as well? Correct. It's the right location. The question was, as it relates to the video, I had a video on fusing. It's on YouTube. About the location of the fuse. Yes, this fuse would blow. And that would? That'd be perfect. It would protect the circuit. Because it's. prevent a fire. No, it will prevent a fire. It's in the right location. It's at the beginning of the real circuit. So, Always fuse, and the battery, you should always have a fuse starting from the battery down. Always, 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 always. Always. Same thing with the inverter charger. You don't need a fuse at the beginning of the inverter. You have a fuse at the battery. The battery is what you worry about. The battery has so much power. Can I ask you a question? Why, um, why do you need two chargers for a start and for the house battery? My, my, my boat's got two chargers. Why is that necessary? But, yeah, so the question is, why do I need two chargers on my boat, one for the start battery and one for the house battery? Yeah. It's unusual. A charger is, by definition, most of them a multi-output charger. Some are single output. Generally, what would happen is you have an inverter charger on your house, which is common, <coughs> single output device, right? Pulls and pushes, right? Pulls to create it, DC, pushes to create charging. And then you're like, well, I've got an engine battery, how am I going to charge that? You could do it through battery combiners that we talked about, but there's implications of that. You could do it through an echo charge, implications of that. Or what you might say is like, oh, well, you know what? If I put a small, small single output charger, which is maybe $100, $200, whenever the AC shore power is connected, that engine battery will have its own charge. And that's why you would do it. In an ideal world, every battery, well, in an ideal world, you almost have a charger per battery. You would. I mean, why not? There's a reason, cost, space, and time. But there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with that. Yes, question? If that were an inverter charger, mm -hmm. where would, would you fuse? How would you no, it would be the same thing. You'd have the fuse You'd have the fuse at the battery. Absolutely, black and white at the battery. Always the battery. Always the battery. Remember, an inverter charger can only do, I don't know, you got a big one, 150 amp charge output. The wire's too hot. Can your batteries give more than 150 amps? Yes. <laughs> Hey, listen, if it can melt a wire, <laughs> like melt a wire, it's definitely more than 150 amps. <clears throat> so how big a fuse uh, would you want a battery or a circuit? Well, it depends on the battery charger. It depends on the wire. The question is, what size do you put up a fuse? Remember, there is no simple answer to anything, right? Everything is context-driven. There is no golden formula. There's no little, like, cheat sheet. 40 amp charger. Okay, maximum output from that charger is 40 amp. There's no such thing as a 40 amp rated wire. Wire is gauge 10, 30 amps. Next size up is gauge 8, 8 amp, 50 amps. Okay, 50 amp wire, which means gauge 8. I want a ratio of 1.25 so I do not get nuisance tripping. 1.25 times 40 equals 50 amps. 50 amp fuse. That's how you fuse a 40 amp charger. If you told me what's a 100 amp charger, then I'd do the same approach, but it'd be a completely different answer. Right? Everything is, I mean, we, gotta, we can't be, I mean, of course, you can't be scared of math, right? But it's, it's just math. It's just, just math. You just calculate. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically a charger. This is common, by the way, right? Like, like, people with charging problems on boats, that's right up there. Like, if you're, keep your mind open, because this is something you have on your boat, and this is important. This is how you maintain your batteries. Because think about it, most of the time you have a refrigerator that's running off your house switch which is left on, connected to your unswitch distribution, connected to your house battery, and if you don't have a charger to maintain your battery when you're off the boat, you're gonna come back and your batteries will be dead. Right? So there are loads on your batteries when you're not on board. Bilge pumps, refrigerator, right? So you wanna make sure that the charger is offsetting those loads. So before you leave the boat, you should be always checking, is my voltage on my batteries, has it gone up before? You look at what your charging voltage was, or your voltage before turning the charger on, and what it is after you leave, or before you leave. It's not about a value, it's about an incremental difference. 
because your batteries could have been empty and your batteries could be charging at 12 volts. If they were 11 before, they could only be at 12 if it's a small charger, right? You can't say, oh, a charging voltage is only 13.3. No, a charging voltage is the incremental differential of voltage from where you were before, right? If your batteries were dead at 10.5, don't expect your charger to bring your batteries to 14.4 volts in an instant. It's gonna take time to get there. How you know your charger is working is by looking at the difference before it was on, after it was on. What's the delta? Yes? Well, if you're an anchor and you don't have an uh, ability to charge your batteries, what is the level of voltage that you would recommend to drop before you start your engine? Yeah. This is why next year it's going to be a two-day mandatory course. Very good question. <laughs> Very good question. We answered that yesterday. Oh. Voltage, I'll take that aside just for the sake of the people who were here in the room, but yeah, voltage is not a way to indicate, is never a way for you to make a decision on if you should charge your batteries or not. It should be an amp hour meter. I'll talk about that later. We'll do offline. Yeah, battery monitor. Yeah, who said that? Oh, that's awesome. God. Go star. He was, but I love it. That means he's listening. All right, all right. Okay, so any questions on charging? Yeah, go ahead. Do you use dielectric grease? I don't. I don't. Nope. I'm really big on cleanliness. I don't think our salinity level here is, warranties it. We don't, there is no salt water here, by the way. Like, anybody who swam in the Caribbean knows that this is not salt water. The salinity here is a joke. It's a joke. The Fraser is a monument of fresh water coming down into this, this whole basin here, this whole Georgia thing, there is no, the salinity level here is a joke. You go in the Caribbean, you go swim for fun, open your eyes underwater and see what type of grown man you are when you come out and you're in, in tears. Okay, this thing is like as fresh as it gets. <laughs> like the, the river, I mean these mountains and the amount of snow that's on there in the summer and the freshwater runoff, no. There's, if I was in Hawaii, I'd start entertaining. Florida, Panhandle, oh yeah, absolutely. You know, totally different. But over here, absolutely, I don't think so. No need, no need at all. I've never used it on my boat. I don't ever use it on people's boat. Never had a problem. But again, it depends on your area, right? It depends on your area. So, ponding across the ocean, use, use the grease? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're going to places like Hawaii, people in Hawaii have to change their rigging every 10 years. It's suicide not to. Things rusting like crazy. How many people are changing their standing rigging here on their boat every 10 years? No one. What kind of grease is this? Dielectric grease. It's, there's, there's implications of using that. There's implications. <clears throat> Yeah, I like maybe a spray, Shield T9, maybe a little bit better, you know? But it can get messy, right? Like, it can get messy, right? I like cleanliness. I've got an OCD problem. It's a problem, I acknowledge it. It somehow has propelled me in this business, but it is a problem, and I like cleanliness. I like order. And when something's greasy and all messy, and then it catches dirt and it's all disgusting, I, my mind can't let go. I'm just like, I gotta clean it. And then I remove the dielectric grease, and then I'm back to square one. So I just can't do it. And I don't see a need to. Not here. Question? Is, 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 is there a problem with inadvertently having solar panel regulator on, uh, or shore power battery charger on, and you start your engine and alternator is now on, and you don't shut the solar panels off? Or no. Is that a problem? It's a complicated question. There are implications to that question. It's not a problem. It can just make the life of your alternator a little bit complicated but you should not start your engine with a charger on. There's reasons for that. But having solar panels connected won't matter. Won't matter. But charger, if I told the why to everything, honestly, yeah, well, I don't want to tell you, you can't, you can't, it'd be crazy. We need like, like sleeping pills, like it'd be, like, like it'd be crazy. But the, the end result is don't have a charger on when you start your boat. There's a few good reasons for that. But don't worry about solar, don't worry about solar. Any other questions on troubleshooting or diagnosing a charger issue on a boat?